Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming after your lunch. It's a very short session now. We have uh, here in the room uh, Marie Pecarelli yeah. and also Will Stroll. Online, we will have uh, Rosa Fine, who is the moderator, who unfortunately couldn't stay here. And the only person who appears on the program is, uh, it was not possible to come or uh, to participate online due to health situations. So, without uh, standing too long, I give the uh, mistake to, to me. Right. Thank you, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. And I'm the organizers uh, of the conference. Uh, so I'm Angry Dani. I'm a doctor in history. My PhD was about the history of nighttime radio in France from 1945 until 2012. I am now a lecturer in Paris One University, and I also worked in radio and podcast. In this contribution, I will present some, some initiatives of nighttime radio programs launched during the lockdowns in the victims of the pandemic of COVID-19. Okay. Uh, thank you, So this unprecedented situation, uh, the pandemic, has planned us collectively and individually into a new relationship with the world, with our homes, for those who are living on the internet, and with the others, with those of the first physical distances. Also, the sprinkles have given rise to a new relationship with the night, because nighttime has become a kind of forbidden territory, since it has become illegal to go on out at night in the public space during long months of countries which took place in most countries. Our ways of experiencing and living in the night were down to a transition form. At the same time, while staying isolated at home, our use of media was also deep in fact the government. I will not well well here on the consequences of these restrictions add on nightlife, even if there is much to study on the matter and some presentation even in the conference and society very well. But I will concentrate on the effects these restrictions had on late night radio. From March 2020, various initiatives of nocturnal radio broadcasting merged coming from traditional radio stations, but also from non professional radio workers. And I will present some of these. To introduce the topic, we will observe a brief history of the special bond between radio and the nights. And what COVID did to radio. After this introduction, we we'll analyze some initiatives of night and radio broadcast during the lockdown in two months, including the reinforcement of night and phone teams, broadcast based on code of listeners, with presenters broadcasting live from home, and some live reports and some documentaries which echo the COVID noise. So, radio and nights, the history of the spectrum bomb. As you may know, radio is approximately 100 years old. We celebrate this period, the centenary of this media. In the US, for example, this anniversary took place in 2020, in France in 2021, and in Great Britain, the BBC celebrates its anniversary this year. Even if radio is a centenary media for decades, it did not end broadcast after a certain hour of the night, because for long, the radio managing directors didn't take in consideration the people of the night. Progressively, during the same part of the 20th century, especially in the 1960s and 1970s, radio stations largely extended their schedule, their schedule into the night and started to propose some very particular late, late night broadcasts where a certain freedom of speech began to emerge. Here are some references about this history. The book by the media historian Michael Keyes for the American Park and my book, an article about French days. The invention of call-ins or call-ins programs, especially, became the vital of this night people's voice making them audible for the third time in the public space. 
Beyond is the voice and life of ordinary people in shame some visibility. Nighttime radio constituted then a space for freedom, experimentation, creation, and intimacy. It also created an unprecedented intimacy between radio hosts and radio listeners, because listeners are more available at night, often alone, in need of voices to keep them company, and they're also more open to sensitivity and confidences. We can say that radio and the night go well together in various aspects. While there is no image transmitted by radio, nighttime is a moment when the sight becomes less important when the hearing can come first. The anthropologist Felonic Nalungrat wrote, at night, the here is like a night. These two objects, radio and night, stimulate a lot the imagination and their both vehicle to intimacy once again. Also, late night radio could provide some company and comfort. It could help people to feel less lonely, while anxieties can be felt more strongly at night. However, since the beginning of the 2000s, for economic reasons and because of the limitations of the eating habits, particularly the rich eruption of broadcasting, the radio stations have properly limited their nightlife programs and have often completely cut off all night broadcasts after late hours in most radio stations. Nevertheless, the, research, the, sorry, the eruption of COVID 19 crisis showed how much nighttime radio could be important and important and constitute a real company. We'll see now what COVID uh, we'll see now what COVID will do with you. In a world turned upside down by the pandemic, radio stations like all the media have had to adapt to the situation, first of all, to ensure the continuity of the program. In some radio stations, to limit the number of people present in studios, some programs were completely stopped at the, at the beginning of the confinement. Some broadcasts kept going or started again progressively, but the radio us and the people invited and there were doing it from distance at home. This profoundly changed the professional practices, contributing to plant these radio workers in an activity more productive to the, their intimacy. Consequently, the pandemic has brought presenters closer to their audience, as emphasized by this article published on the BBC website. We could also cite B and A from LBC Radio in Britain. I'm literally broadcasting from my bedroom because it's the only room in the house with a carpet, so it sucks that we are the vehicles. The target, the pretty elbow, the curtains. They all make much more of a studio sound. You really have got this one-to-one -one feel. I've got a couple of friends say, you think since you've been doing this at home, you're something much more personal or intimate. If the contents of radio broadcast as well as the modern medias was largely focused on information for expanding the spread of the virus, on another hand, new sorts of programs emerge. And radio professionals have shown great creativity to limit their productivity. Several papers insisted on the importance of radio in times of the building, a medium that has played a huge role in bringing us together during lockdown. The Garden title, for example, is what people turn to while radio is bringing in lockdown. In a paper written on behalf of the United Nations, states radio provides solace during COVID-19 pandemic. In most countries, in fact, all just numbers for live radio seem to have soared during lockdown. For a paper published in early May 2020, the researcher Emma Rodero worked on a survey about listening habits and radio consumptions in Spain during lockdown. The results show that radio listeners consumed more hours of radio and positions radio as the medium that was best covering information about the virus and the one that they considered most credible, but also the closest, that most stimulated their imagination, that reduced loneliness, and was the most distracting. We'll see now more specifically what were the consequences concerning lifetime radio. First of all, there was a new importance accorded to night broadcasts. In BBC Five Live, for example, the existing program 
top of night broadcast every night from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. consisted mostly of updates and news stories around the world, with a short talking with listeners at the beginning. In March 2020, it was replaced by an entire program of phoning with interactive calls with listeners, that is, with much more time devoted to the voice of the listeners. This audience interaction and conversation have been such a hit during lockdown that it remained at the heart of the new version of a new version of the show launched in July 2020. Dalton Adebayo, the presenter, says this program has always been for night people who like to talk, driving home or home alone, or listening to earphones because your partner is asleep, your partner is asleep, and the day is silent. Over recent months, the conversation has taken us to every nook and cranny in the country where it has been needed more than ever. Every call there is a story. In the second year, Ian Day, producer of LBC Feeding Flow from San Francisco, gave more space to the listeners in the race meeting. And before it was a the super bad part of the show, it was a dialogue with listeners that really resonated their the writing. They has had some extraordinarily low on air encounters since the family started. I have a guy phone in the middle of April saying, I called you because my mother died of coronavirus two hours ago. Your instant thought is why a nurse would be from the radio station two hours after your mother died. The reason was that he wants people to obey the government's instruction because he hasn't. He had gone to visit his mother and no, he thought he passed on the virus to her and basically killed her. Imagine having that weight in your mind. The man then from the young to say and know about the virus himself, and the first time to say that he's recovered. One of the things that the audience like when the caller has a powerful story to tell is to hear the caller. In France, it still existed some nighttime programs designed to receive only listener calls. In particular, Pablo Men, let's talk to each other, and Pablo Lidange, and Dr. Mandel. This broadcast continued during lockdown and took care of them an importance even stronger for listeners. Caroline Dubranche presented the show on phone, and she's in the left part of the screen, <laughs> and this is her dog on the right part. And so she presented the show from home, like some of her collaborators, and every day the team of the program published on the program Facebook page a picture of themselves. In their home or their friends in their home or some video. Here again, a new intimacy was created between the radio host and the audience. Here is how this presenter and psychologist Carl Mengro started one of her show at 10 p.m. in March 2020. Good evening, this is Carolyn Blanche. I'm very happy to meet you again. Let's talk by saying that one. We are with you, we have to put this one to one. If you are confined to your home and you feel anxious, if living with your husband, your wife, your children, you get on your nerves, before you break down, give us a call. You may be worried about one of your parents in the nursing home, all your telephone, all your testimonies are welcome from 10 p.m. to our past meeting. Still in France, there were another broadcast relaunched in May 2020, just after the end of the lockdown. Lumière Bonami, hosted by the Canadian Edouard Gale. From 2017 to 2019, this very popular comedian had presented his radio show once a week on the Monsanter TV station every Sunday night, broadcasting live from the bar. The program gave the space to make resonate the nightlife and artistic, artistic activities all over France. When the pandemic arrived, this program didn't exist anymore. But Constantin Station chose to relaunch it this time on a daily basis at 10 p.m. every night. The new version of the show was very different since it couldn't be broadcast from a bar or be called the nightlight. Edouard Baer was doing it alone from his Parisian apartment. Moreover, he also started to receive phone calls from listeners, which was the new thing. We can see on these pictures the difference between the program in 2018. Now, this relaunching of this program is a huge success. It started in the summer and came on air again during the fall, 
six that Saturday nights during the period. Yeah. The idea was really to bring a special company to the audience during that particular time. Beyond his farming programs on professional radio stations, some non professional also set up during the pandemic. They are all not about radio broadcasts, and particularly the night farming. I can cite in France two cases the weekly farming continuum team in London, which took place during lockdown in spring 2009 on radio campus ferries, presented by volunteers from 10 p.m. until today. And also the radio people very open Tokyo radio, which was created in the city of Grenoble during the period from the fall 2020 and broadcast live every Thursday from 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. This initiative resonates with all the live broadcasting or streaming that emerged on the internet during that time, mostly in video on various platforms, live from DJs, musicians, or an old kind of artist who really like that. United around them, the community of listeners and the viewers, if you comment or artists ask their questions in life. Speaking about music, I also want to mention the existence of being vinyl night radio and internet station playing, playing vinyl records exclusively and exclusively at night, which was created by a Manchester Bay music lover during the lockdown. And this radio still exists today. Lastly, I would like to evolve the variety of live reports or radio documentaries that explore the night and your property, and particularly your nights. For example, the Australian documentary The Fog in the City, Melbourne's COVID Cookie, by Tony McCarthy, which was broadcast on Twins. I suggest we listen to the first two minutes of the program. Let's make that. Are you speaking? Okay. Well, so there is this journalist that can. Uh, leaving his home at 8 p.m. It's the beginning of the paper in Australia at that time. And he took the tram, uh, the line of tram in the city, and he interviewed the people, the few people that got uh, in the tram. In the tram, so there are some homeless people, uh, people coming from work, essential workers. Uh, the, the driver of the tram and also he, he works uh, in the street. And so we can we can hear his, his human voices and also the landscape of Melbourne by nights and in the country. So basically, break the system. Yeah, yeah.
I stood here, but it's a uh, recording is a program if you ever very interesting in this country. So again, in the French program, Lumia Barani, uh, when Edouard Baer is presenting his show from home, the reporter Jacques Souvon explored Paris in the country in life with a microphone, interviewing live people in Nice and describing what he sees, what he feels, walking in the almost deserted streets. For example, in November 2020, I am at Saint Sulpice Square. There is something crazy in that country. Every sound stands out. Every silhouette that appears stands out. Stands out. It's really interesting how, in a very big square, every action is really visible. There are two people walking with a dog. This is the dog world. Are you sure the dog is alone? He asks. There are many curfew dogs. I also wanted to mention a series of some documentaries on French culture to the station about the night during the curfew, the need for the people. The summary of the series states while birds between 7 p.m. and 6 a.m. declared forbidden with a curfew, these hours have become mysterious, found therefore interesting. In theory, there is nothing and no one to see. Everything is empty, you see, or watch TV. You eat, you live in a cluster, a room, or with your family. In five episodes of 30 minutes, we will first explore a hidden dimension by the night. The night birds will continue to party with my little The road by the nights in the restaurant for different drivers of 24 hours, and in an overnight bus line. Oppressing the prayers by night, walking from the beginning of the night until the morning, when the reporter ends at his race in a night of passing. The first episode takes place at night in a retirement home, and also, more surprisingly, in an underground Parisian garden where clandestine five piano concerts take place. In all these song documentaries, we can hear the voices of those we don't usually hear and those we don't really see either, particularly the homeless people who were among the minority of people inhabiting the public space at night during the curfew and London. All of these programs, like news, live reports, and radio documentaries, reveal different behaviors people have to reinvent their way of experiencing and crossing through the night during that particular period. These radio archives constitute them some precious sources to analyze the perception and the experience of some nightlife during that period, as well as a valuable source for understanding the intimate feelings of individuals during this time. I showed you some examples, centered mainly on the French and British cases. But this will, of course, be widely expanded to night and radio in other countries. Thanks a lot for the Hi, everybody. Thanks to the organizers. Um, great to share the stage with Ray. And if you don't read French, you can learn it so you can read the books on the If you do, you should translate them. <laughs> so, the time was about 9 30. So begins. Um, well, I call it on from, um, this is near the beginning of a nighttime investigation, which was featured in a notorious series of articles published in a monthly magazine called Broadway Revenues between January 20, 1924 and January 1925. The series was called Nights in Fairyland, and there were 13 episodes. It claimed to describe and expose the places and practices of queer nightlife in Manhattan at this historical moment. 
Now, I've been working on a book about Broadway graffitis for about 50 and that you're getting more than 20 years, long before there were night studies uh, and things like that. Um, and I'm going to finish it next month, really. Um, the delays in my writing have had to do with the usual distractions of an academic career, administration, and so on. But the main one has to do with the fact that no complete collection of Broadway properties exists in any library, nor is there a complete collection available across the totality of the existing library of the Patsum. And so I've had to wait patiently um, until issues turned up on eBay or other collector sites. Um, and the hardest part of this search has been finding all 13 episodes of the Knights in Fairyland series. Now, this series, 13 articles, has become quite legendary among historians of New York nightlife in the early 20th century, and it's held particular interest for those who tried to reconstruct the geographies of queer nightlife in New York during these years. The historian George Chauncey had access to a few episodes and drew on them for the research which led to his uh, justly acclaimed book, um, Gay New York, which was published in 1995. Um, but the legend of the series well, in fact, there are several reasons why the series is kind of legendary very well among those who have an interest in this period and so on. One is its relentless homophobia, which I'll get to in a second, um, with its sort of um, ongoing attempts to expose queer nightlife as a source of moral decay and civilizational collapse. Um, at the same time, though, as with so much homophobic discourse of the time, these columns are one of the few sources alongside police reports and so on, through which New York's queer geographies in the early 1920s, or in the early 20th century, may be understood. The magazine in which Knights in Fairyland um, appeared was called Broadway Revenue, which had been launched in 1916 by New York businessmen as a vehicle for news and gossip about the entertainment world, so at this point, mostly theater, a bit of cinema. In 1917, it was about to go bankrupt and disappear, but it was taken over by this man, with whom um, much of my uh, adult life has been obsessed now, a man named Stephen G. Clove, who moved to New York from Prince Edward Island in Canada in 1898 or 1899, um, had tried to establish himself as a poet and publisher of literary works in New York, but when this failed, he used an inheritance to buy Broadway revenues. And under his editorship, beginning in um, 1917, the magazine's homophobic impulses began to reveal themselves. Um, and they did so first for about the first seven years in little bits sprinkled throughout its um, gossip column, most of which focused on the lesbian coteries which the magazine claimed to find at the Algonquin Hotel of Algonquin Roundtable thing. Um, and at the, the Algonquin Hotel at this point was a hotel in which very a great many young women of the theater and cinema um, lived. Um, and Broadway Brevities referred, referred to this coterie of allegedly queer uh, women as the horse women of the apocalypse. <laughs> yes, um, misspelling apocalypse to give the word a vaguely sexual connotation um, and using the term horse women to suggest somehow that the men involved were masculine in disposition. Um, the very phrase, um, horsewomen of the apocalypse, I can put it pushing the wrong button, um, was itself referring paraphrodically to the very recent hit film um, featuring um, Rudolph Valentino, the four horsewomen of the apocalypse. Um, but it's with the Knights and Fairyland series, launched in January 1924, that Broadway Brevity's documentation of Manhattan queer life became systematic and full of detail. And with just a few exceptions, each of the 13 episodes begins with the author narrator venturing out into um, the night, either um, alone or with his companion, a boxer named Gentleman Jack O'Brien, who I think. Um, Stephen G. Glow was secretly in love with or perhaps having a relationship with, but I'm not, um, not going to uh, draw you into that and all that um, reluctant about that. Um, sometimes, as in this first episode, um, the narrator would begin observing queer people on the street before following them into nightclubs. And the episode will often begin with Chloe and or uh, and perhaps Gentleman Jack O'Brien 
sort of following a, a, a couple or a single man um, as they move towards a club and going. This is this is especially the case when, as in this first episode, the nighttime journeys were in midtown Manhattan. Um, with queer night, night in that district constantly changing location, identifying queer people in the street and following them seemed to be one of the most effective ways of sort of identifying the spaces of queer um, sociability. In this first episode, the narrators observe queer couplings on the street and then follow those involved um, into a club situated at the corner of 66th Street and Columbus Avenue. Um, like many of the Midtown clubs visited in the series, this one, which is left unnamed, seemed to be a place in which sailors on leave connected with men who worked in the theatrical industry. You know, it's interesting to see the main sort of dynamic. The series is full of stories intended to convey something of the inevitable heartbreak um, of this version of queer life. The theatrical men, the effeminate men, constantly having their hearts broken by cold and affectionless sailors. Um, end up often being robbed of their possessions in clubs where one of course would not care to call the police. Um, the Nights in Paradise series followed the narrative patterns of previous um, reports on under, underground night life in New York. Its structure was similar to the Sin Tours, for example, undertaken by the Reverend Charles P. Pankhurst and various companions in the 1890s and recounted by one of these journalists in the 1894 book, The Doctor and the Devil, which is a kind of classic of uh, um, New York nightlife literature. In these, and as in so many other texts, the entry into a nightclub is typically followed by passages in which the narrator observes the behavior um, of those um, inside. And then in a common transition, the reporter approaches one or more of the customers to learn about their situation and experiences. And here we have from the first episode of Nights in Fairyland, Stephen G. Klo recounting um, his approach um, of uh, one of the customers at this unnamed mid um, town club. He approached one young man whose absolutely beardless face, delicate features, and flamboyant jewelry proclaimed his ad avocation. Um, we weren't well, I didn't copy here, now I can't read the word. We weren't wrong, spoke about offering him cigarettes called for three splits of ginger ale. He succumbed to the new sympathetic environment. He told us that he had experienced unusual instincts as early in his childhood as he could remember. He was very clever at sketching and he worked as a commercial artist. He said his name was Paul B, but then among his intimates, he preferred to be called Polly. Lou and I called him Polly thereafter and he seemed very pleased. He told us bluntly why he came to the dance hall. The sailors were gathered there and although he preferred normal associates to the Jackies, centered there to seek such as he, his conquests were consequently both numerous and remunerative. Um, now, as the Knights in Fairyland series continues, its focus shifted by about episode three or four to Lower Manhattan. More and more of the events recounted took place in the clubs of Greenwich Village. And in fact, this series is quite helpful for people trying to reconstruct queer life and queer spaces in Greenwich Village. But there was another shift as well. Increasingly, the series became engaged in attacking the lesbian women to be found in Manhattan nightlife. Um, and then a pattern that reaches back to those earlier jokes about the horse woman of the apocalypse at the Algonquin Hotel. Um, the Nights in Fairyland series develops as it moves on an obsession with the figure of the predatory lesbian. Um, in the third episode of the series, Chloe and his companions visit a place called Paul and Joe's. Now, at this point in its history, Paul and Joe's was located in the Manhattan neighborhood of Chelsea on 19th Street between 5th and 6th Avenues. And unlike the places visited up to this point in the series, whose clientele was dominated by gay men, Paul and Joe's was a significant meeting ground for lesbians. And in reference to these lesbians, the author writes, and there's a quote, I refer to the forced women who make this tabado palace their rendezvous every Saturday and Sunday evening. Their depredations against the morality of the land are far more virulent than those of the male androgyny. The male is at least amusing, but the lesbian is not even that. She is gross, immoral, from almost unbelievable depths, morose, and designing. Um, and this distinction would structure many of the articles to come in the series. That between effeminate men who were pathetic and doomed to unhappiness 
the magazine was convinced, and the predatory lesbian woman called and manipulated them. Um, in the conclusion to Nights in Fairyland number three, the author claims, in fact, that Brevity's own exposés of lesbian behavior had had the effect of bringing down the rate of lesbianism um, in New York, if you can uh, imagine such a thing. We believe that we are successful in throwing the vivid, vivid calcium on their dark doings, and as a result, their profane in activities in New York have noticeably lessened all character. At least they, the lesbians, do not patrol the cafes and women's tea rooms in search of human prey, which was the case a year ago, prior to our now world famous um, exposures. Now, in fact, by the time this article appeared, Broadway Brevities was in deep trouble and would only survive for um, a few more months. In April 1924, the federal assistant um, attorney general for the Southern New York Division charged Stephen G. Clo, his partners in the magazine, and the magazine itself with using the postal system to defraud people. Um, this is how they made it a federal case. The magazine, it was revealed, had been blackmailing famous people of industry and show business, threatening to reveal their secrets if they did not purchase advertising in the magazine. And those, in, in fact, who had paid the magazine for its silence included D.W. Griffith, the famous filmmaker, Jules Leichman, the East King, um, well-known industrialist, and two dozen others. The trial was set for December 24, 1924, and then moved to January 1925. Now, the charges against Clove and Broadway Brevities had nothing to do with its crusade against the place of the queer Manhattan nightlife. Indeed, indeed, the Knights and Fairyland series wasn't mentioned in any of the legal documents, nor was there any reference to it in the criminal trial. Um, nevertheless, faced with legal charges and an upcoming trial, the magazine clearly believed that by turning its attention to attacks on anonymous queer men and women who assembled in Manhattan night spots, it was moving away from the risky attacks on the rich and famous, which had gotten them in trouble. It's quite clear as well that Broadway Gravity believed its attacks on queer Manhattan nightlife would bring it an air of virtue, which was threatened by the highly publicized charges of blackmail um, that it had faced. And this advertisement, I have it here. Yeah, this advertisement, which ran in um, the New York Daily um, Mirror just as the magazine had been indicted and um, was headed towards trial, we find the, the, the magazine claiming some of its virtue. Now, the Knights in Fairyland series ended with the January 1925 issue of Broadway Brevities, which was also the magazine's last. In that month, Clo and his associates went on trial, a trial that newspapers claimed was the greatest show on earth. Clo and his associates were found guilty. The magazine ceased publication. Clo went to the Atlanta Penitentiary for two years. In 1930, looking back, Time Magazine called him the most famous and wicked blackmailer in U.S. history. A slight exaggeration. Um, in 1930, Clo relaunched Brevities, this time as a slick monthly magazine with a thick embossed cover. Um, the climate in New York City was now significantly different from that which marked the period in which the original Knights in Fairyland had appeared. New York was now in the midst of what has been called the pansy craze, in which transvestite and transgender performers were attracting audiences of all sexualities to clubs throughout Manhattan. Um, and in, in this revived version of Broadway Brevities, um, Clo tries to sort of the editor Clo to set himself in the midst of this queer effervescence, but really reveals how much he was out of touch. Um, and so to give his magazine purpose, he went back to his attacks on queer women, beginning with an article, um, is your daughter safe? Safe from what? Safe from the lesbian, mm -hmm. um, which appeared in uh, the 1930 uh, issue of Brevity. And the article really resurrects his whole um, vision of lesbians as being serious predators. The fact that the book, The Well of Loneliness, the uh, uh, rap that Paul book has just come out is somehow um, vindication of of what he's been thinking. So just to, to um, close, in 1931, Flo left this new version of Broadway Remedies. The periodical continued without him, but became a weekly tabloid newspaper. 
And this is the version we really, which is commemorated on gay history sites um, and other genealogies of queer New York. I've met colleagues in the Sex Museum in New York for a, an exhibit several years ago on queer Manhattan. This is largely because of its notorious um, covers, um, which among a, the, probably the most striking thing about them is the rude double entendres that run through them. And I, I, I know we have various levels of, uh, uh, of English speaking here, so all of the puns might not be clear, but I think, you know, Pansy, Chloe, you have a queer sweet sucker. You don't, <laughs> you don't have to be uh, to a master of the English language to see the sexual innuendo there. Fag ball is exposed. Uh, <laughs> Chicago World's Fairies, third sex um, plague spreads the news, and so on. Now, in this tabloid version, without Stephen Chloe, Clo, um, it was really despite what seems to be sort of endless walking uh, and even denunciation of, of um, queer populations, the, the, the tabloid was kind of too smart to go in for crude um, homophobia um, and lesbophobia, which were now at least slightly um, out of fashion. And I'll close with this um, cover, this cover from the November 16, 1931 slide. Now it's common to Sapex sister scram to see this um, as performing a kind of moral panic um, depression drives ladies of lesbos can almost see deserting boot boys for jobs and uh, feminine thrills. Um, I don't even know how to, how to make sense of that. But the article is, in fact, largely mourning the disappearance of places of encounter for um, queer women and the fact that so many of these women were leaving New York and leaving the United States, in fact, for more hospitable um, places. And this article seems to have been written by an unsuck inside of it. It had references to things like supple tongued sirens, we have reference to lesbians, that are not to be, and perhaps even slightly mocking, but they're somehow a kind of respectful um, tone. Um, the article points out that Eve Adams, once the queen of the third sex, has fled to Paris where her Le Boudoir de l'Amour en Montmartre attacks, tracks the supple from sirens of the lesbian um, element. Eve Adams, of the, of the, an important uh, New York lesbian of this time, moves to Paris and ultimately dies in the Holocaust. Um, dashing Peter Carlyle, this is quoting again, the terror of the old black rabbit that held sway at the corner of McDougal and Minetta in the village after her sensational swim from Lombard Island has departed, leaving behind her the whale of 1931. And the most striking thing about this article is really um, the repertorial journalistic clarity with which it described an ongoing series of police actions against lesbian spaces. But most important is through the references to place that are in the article as part of its narrativization as part of its expose that we can piece together some of the queer geographies of early 20th century New York nightlife. Thank you. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Hello. Should I, uh, yeah, we still can. Uh, 